Welcome. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the European Parliament. I am grateful to the Euroscola programme for the key role it plays in encouraging you, the next generation of Europeans, to talk about Europe, to air your views on European democracy, on our common values, on the environment, on the issues that matter to you and on our common future. We are living extraordinary times during which we have had to adapt to a pandemic. We have had to reinvent ourselves and to make unprecedented life changes. We've developed new policies that respond to the expectations of Europeans, so in order for us to establish a new normality. I hope that we will soon see the light at the end of the tunnel of this far-reaching COVID crisis. And thankfully, throughout it, EU democracy was not suspended. I am very pleased to be with people like you who care about Europe who dedicate time and energy to supporting a more united and a more caring Europe. Europe needs a new generation of champions. Europe needs you. In a changing world, a young generation of Europeans has the opportunity with us to make a fairer, greener, more digital and more united Europe. A Europe which is about all of us standing up for one another. You are not alone. You have the support of the European institutions. You have the support of the European Parliament. The best proof of this is that you are here today to follow a session of Euroscola, which has been running non-stop since 1990. Euroscola is part of our democracy. It's an opportunity to be heard and to share ideas with other young people from across the European Union and also from the United Kingdom. We speak different languages, have different points of view, different cultures, traditions, abilities, but our differences are what make us European. They make us stronger and we celebrate them. The world of education has undergone radical changes that have affected every student. But as we pull out of the pandemic, new digital communication tools allow for new opportunities. And Euroscola is a good example of how the European Parliament, in following a digital agenda, can now burst out of the Strasbourg-Brussels bubble and reach young citizens in an unprecedented way. Democracy is moving forward and is adapting. The pandemic has increased European solidarity, but we must sustain it. We must be ambitious. European solidarity must continue. We need to move forward all together while supporting young Europeans, because you are the impetus for a better Europe. You will be at the heart of our policies. You must feel fully involved in our debates. Europe is not an abstract entity removed from European people's daily lives. Europe's role in the world needs to be decisive. We must own our European identity in order to shape Europe's future. And this is why I ask you to continue what you are doing here today, to continue to be interested in Europe, to continue to debate about Europe. We Europeans don't always all agree, but we need to agree on the necessity to hold debates, to listen to the other side, because this is what democracy is about. From its headquarters in Strasbourg to the outreaches of the European Union, the European Parliament is our collective house of democracy, a forum to express opinions and a forum for dialogue. It is also a place to gain knowledge. In this respect, we are delighted that thanks to the benefits of the digital age, Dr. David Lowe will be joining our conversation today. We will be talking to one of the lead authors of a 2007 climate change report, which received the Nobel Peace Prize, and the author of The Alarmist, 50 Years Measuring Climate Change. Thank you, Dave. We are grateful to you for joining us with your knowledge on a grave concern that is so important to all of us, the alarming urgency of addressing climate change. Dear students, dear teachers, thank you for being here. I am proud of what you are doing. You are the future of Europe, and it is our role to encourage you to turn your ideas into action. So enjoy this session. I would like to welcome also on my turn to this new session of Euroscola in the new year. 
today, 71 schools and 2,130 students from 18 different member states all over the European Union are actively participating. We want to get to know you. We want to know from which country you're joining us today. So please go on Slido. And there we have the first countries that we see. We see Spain, Hola España, we see Poland, France, and the bigger the bubble is, the more participants come from this EU member state. So the Spain is leading at the moment, but we have France, uh, France, the Czech Republic, Austria, Greece. What do you see, Jacob? Latvia, we also see Ireland, welcome, Greece, and... Yes, please make sure to enter your country name in English. I know that you are more, you're like at least 1,000. During the pandemic, confinement has been something which has uh, affected even the environment. The pollution in the environment has reduced considerably. And I simply wanted to ask, how can we carry this on into the future? La pandemia, en effet, uh, during the pandemic, we saw human activity reduced, and that had some good uh, effects on the environment. But there were negative impacts on some groups of people. For example, we saw elderly people dying of COVID, but some died because what happened was that they just slipped towards death, if you like. They stopped fighting to stay alive. If you like, we could say they died of sadness. So we saw how important social relations are for people. At the other end of the scale, young people are affected too. Uh, school lessons by video conference meant that you could avoid public transport, but it did leave people feeling very much alone, a long way away from their friends, a long way away from the classroom, which is a motivation sometimes to be in the classroom, and they weren't able to debate things. So some children, some young people did suffer from uh, types of depression. It's very interesting, therefore, to look at all of the impacts the crisis had. Very slowly, sociological studies are starting to show their results, and that gives us a more balanced view. And I think it helps us accept some of the measures that were imposed upon us at the time. But we have to be aware that there was not just a health risk, but also a social risk. In France, for example, we decided to keep the uh, schools open uh, with the exception of the first lockdown in the spring of 2020. And that did limit the negative impact on some of the more vulnerable children. We learned things then. We learned how to work by video conference, which is sometimes quite convenient, after all, uh, if you want to carry on doing something think when you're not actually in the same place as that thing. Good morning to you, but it's actually good evening here in New Zealand. It's summer and it's around about 10.30 at night, but it's a real privilege for me to be able to speak to the school students of Europe. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the question is, what are the economic costs of non-stopping the climate change now? Let's put it this way. What is the cost of not stopping climate change? And uh, here in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, 18 months ago, Australia experienced massive wildfires that killed an estimated 1 billion animals. What, what is the cost of that? It's absolutely colossal. Uh, the same thing with flooding events that occurred in Germany last year. These are huge costs. Now, economists, um, there was a very uh, impressive report by a Nobel Prize winning economist that showed that if you try to reduce carbon emissions and you're successful with that, then the GDP, uh, combined GDP of the whole earth, will go, you'll lose around about 2% uh, over the next 20 years. So this is a huge amount of money, but the same economist showed that the net effects of all the floods, the fires, and all the other damage 
is way, way higher than that. It's absolutely devastating. So, um, yes, there will be a cost to combating climate change. It's a massive task, uh, learning how to reduce carbon emissions. But the alternative is unthinkable, especially for young people. We wanted to suggest uh, um, the usage of nuclear uh, energy uh, and in particular the fusion process uh, uh, in order to produce electricity because it is uh, considered the cleanest uh, process uh, to produce electricity among all the nuclear processes that we have studied uh, in this period. One journal. <laughs> you're, you're actually talking to the wrong person because New Zealand is nuclear free. Um, we have legislation, government legislation, that bans nuclear power and nuclear ships. <clears throat> now, my experience with nuclear power is what I've seen happen in other countries. Uh, Chernobyl, uh, Fukushima in Japan. The problem with nuclear power has been um, if things go wrong. And unfortunately, they do go wrong. Now, there's an organization called the IEA, the International Energy Association, that always promoted nuclear power. But they have now shown that in actual fact, we can fulfill all the world's needs with the use of renewables. Now, this will take a while for the transition, but there's actually no need to go to nuclear power. And what I'm talking about here is the existing nuclear power, which is fission. So you're fissioning um, elements like uranium. I'm not talking about fusion, because fusion is still not developed. In fact, I clearly remember 50 years ago that fusion was only 20 years away. And then 20 years after that, it was still only 20 years away. <laughs> so I, I think a fusion is still a long way away. I'm sorry, but I, I don't agree with the idea of using nuclear power to get us out of it, uh, to uh, produce our energy needs. I, I think the question was more about nuclear uh, fusion. Uh, so on, that, on this topic, I can say that uh, the EU is contributing to an international project called ITER, which is now developing uh, this technology, the nu nuclear fusion, but uh, as Mr. Lowe has just said, the technology is not, uh, I mean, is not now um, workable at the moment. And concerning uh, nuclear fission, which is the classical uh, nuclear energy, as you've said, at EU level, uh, there has been recent developments in the framework of a new regulation to define what kind of activity can be considered as green uh, to receive funding. So there are different categories of activities that should not impact the environment. And recently, at the moment, it's not uh, over yet, but there has been some proposals by the European Commission to consider uh, nuclear energy as well as gas as uh, potentially going into this green uh, category under certain conditions, considering that it would it could replace some technologies that are uh, emitting a lot of CO2 emissions, like coal uh, in some countries. But as you can imagine, this topic is very controversial, especially because uh, nuclear energy produces a lot of waste that we cannot uh, yet uh, recycle or, uh, or make clean. Uh, but the advantage of nuclear energy is that it's uh, decarbonized. So at the moment, it's a very sensitive issue at EU level. And if you want to follow these issues, I'm sure there will be many development in the coming weeks in the European Parliament. It will be debated in uh, the, the committees of the Parliament. And then there will be a formal vote in plenary in the coming, in the coming months. So uh, I encourage you to, to, to follow these interesting topics. Okay, time for some action. Now you will have one minute to vote and I will use the official words used by the President of the European Parliament, normally sitting in this chair, the vote is now open. So please use this opportunity, vote and share and vote for the best idea. We see that there are already 50, no, 63, 100 people who <laughs> it's voted. Faster and faster. <laughs> it's going faster and faster. Five, four, three, two, one. The vote is now closed and we have a winner.
Yeah, and it was a tight race. So the winner is we could reduce plastic waste and buy regional products. The remarkable debates within, with today's speakers indicate that you demand action through EU-level policies. In fact, you were very eager to discuss about the EU's initiatives to promote sustainability across policy areas and its plans to protect bi bi uh, biodiversity, reduce pollution and tackle global warming. I'm happy that you had the opportunity to interact uh, with the distinguished personalities um, like uh, Dave Love uh, and his groundbreaking work on climate change with European Parliament Quester uh, Mrs. Keller and policy expert Guillaume uh, Ragunot.